Hey folks, back off here. So the Trump apocalypse continues to to march on and continues to piss off all the right people. I mentioned this on a, a live stream I did over the weekend. Breakpoint did for their weekend show basically kind of a hit piece on Trump. Um I'm going to play it and I'm going to respond to it as as uh, I feel appropriate. John Stone Street was uh, the host, as he is, I believe, every week. And his guests were Reverend Samuel Rodriguez and Dr. Russell Moore. Um, let's see. Reverend Rodriguez is um, some Hispanic pastor that uh, talks about immigration issues, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Russell Moore, I know, is the... Uh, what is it? The, something in the Southern Baptist... Uh, can, uh, hang on. Let's find it here. He's the uh, Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. Or uh, He's in that uh, commission. And uh, Samuel Rodriguez, founder of the National Hispanic Christian Leaders Conference. And they wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal called Immigrant Bashers Will Lose the Evangelical Vote. Which was directed at Trump and... Trump supporters. Now, the problem with that is obviously um, there's been quite a few polls recently that shows Trump is dominating amongst evangelicals, which uh, I will get into as as I play this. I I tested the audio. Um, all three of these guys sound okay. I, I skipped over the intro part, but I'm going to play it and as appropriate. I'm going to comment. From the Chuck Colson Center for Christian Worldview, this is Breakpoint This Week with John Stone Street. Well, with the many personalities involved in the recent debates, hot-button issues were sure to come to the forefront, and they did. Let's join John and guests for more perspective. It seems far too early to be talking about the whole political process, particularly the uh, 2016 presidential election. But the first Republican candidate debate had more viewers on Fox News than the election night in 2012 had. Like it or not, the campaign season is a... Why do you suppose that is, John? Just curious. Why do you suppose that is? Could it be there's actually a candidate people are kind of excited about? Upon us. And uh, one of the key issues of this election, as it has been for the last several elections, is the issue of immigration. And uh, there continues to be this question of how do Christians, how do evangelicals deeply engage the political process on these issues, particularly ones uh, so clearly identified with one side of the political spectrum or the other. And uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a terrific article in the Wall Street Journal uh, co-authored uh, by my guest today, Dr. Russell Moore, uh, the president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, and Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, uh, who is the uh, the founder and president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. And uh, the article is entitled, Immigrant Bashers Will Lose the evangelical vote, and uh, it was in direct response, I think, uh, to a comment made uh, by the leading Republican candidate right now, uh, and that is Donald Trump. And so, I've been I just want to point out once again, the title is proving wrong so far, according to the polls, and I don't, I haven't listened to this whole thing since Saturday, but I don't believe they bring that up once. Could be wrong. I've invited both of these men on. They've both been on the program before. And uh, Dr. Moore, uh, Reverend Rodriguez, thank you for joining us on Breakpoint this week. Great to be with you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Dr. Moore, let's start with you. Um, you, know, you know, the kind of love-hate relationship of evangelicals with the political process, and it's kind of a, a love-hate relationship that goes both ways. And we hear a lot of young evangelicals that are frustrated with the political process. I'm not sure if this is something that Christians can rightfully be involved in without uh, being compromised. And at the same level, there seems to be, here in 2015, as much interest as uh, ever. You've written about this even just recently in your book, Onward. What does this uh, relationship with the larger culture look like and so on. Do you sense there's any kind of growing frustration with the kind of the larger evangelical population and the political process? Well, I think that uh, there's a tendency within evangelicalism to ping back and forth between extremes. And so I, I think 
think one of the things that we tend to do is to want to avoid the last bad thing. And because so much of evangelical political engagement has been hyper-politicized, partisan, and often led by at least some aspects of it by kind of a, a caucus of lunatics and heretics, uh, we, we have a, a tendency to say, well, let's, let's avoid that. I want to give credit where credit's due. Uh, he's definitely on to something when he says evangelicalism pings between extremes. I've often noted that evangelicalism, one of its major faults is it takes whatever sort of insanity is going on in the culture and does the opposite of insanity. And as has often been said, reverse stupidity is not is not genius. Or to put it another way, um, chastity is not the opposite of sluttiness. Being frigid is the opposite of sluttiness. Chastity is having sex, you know, passionately and and eagerly, but with the person you're supposed to be having sex with, you're, you're only your spouse. Um, as is often the case, true virtue lies between two extremes. So, uh, credit where credit's due. He's definitely on to something there. I wouldn't say evangelicalism pings back and forth like a pendulum so much as they just do or often do the opposite of whatever the culture is doing. By going to the opposite extreme, which means uh, disengagement and a kind of fake apolitical stance. And I say fake because if you have a uh, Christianity that doesn't speak to the social and political, what you wind up with is a hyper-politicized Christianity. That's what we had in the 19th century when uh, many Southern Presbyterians and Southern Baptists would say, let's not speak to politics, let's simply speak to evangelism and discipleship. And by politics, of course, what they meant was the question of human slavery. Well, what that did was to baptize the status quo, which was human slavery. Same. This is wrong partially. It, it's a typical puritanical error in thinking. Um, and ironically enough, it's one that the, the uh, SJWs and the feminists frequently make, uh, you know. Anita Sarkeesian, you know, will often say that, you know, I don't know how that she puts it, but, you know, if, if you don't make a big deal about gender issues, it means you, you know, agree with it. it it's it's that common thing that if you, if you don't want to talk about it, it means you agree with the status quo. Uh, there's a certain case that a church should be somewhat apolitical, at least on many issues, in the sense that you know, within a church, within a church body, we all have political disagreements. We're not all going to see eye to eye on everything. But as with other disagreements, we try to leave those outside. You know, we, we might we might be enemies out this door, but we're not enemies when we come to worship. That's, at least in theory, that's the idea of keeping church largely apolitical. Um... Again, in theory, the the idea, I don't see you do it purpose or perfectly, but this is that typical puritanical thinking. Everything is political. You know, the personal is political is often mentioned, but you know, everything is political to them. Same thing was repeated again uh, when it happened with uh, Jim Crow, and the same thing was happening again in the early years uh, after Roe versus Wade. Uh, in many segments of evangelicalism, not speaking to this issue means speaking to the issue. And so what we have to have is a prophetic voice that engages in every area that, w that we're called to, including our, our social and political lives and callings, but with a prophetic distance so that we're not becoming mascots for any politician or party or ideology. Well, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez, you've been called the leader of the Hispanic evangelical movement. And I think a lot of times uh, when we think of evangelicalism as Americans, uh, we probably don't recognize the diversity in it. And this is the diversity in it. Um, evangelicalism in this culture is, is mostly white and partially black. And it has been <laughs> since there's been evangelicalism. I'm sure there are Hispanic evangelicals. Obviously, he's leading a whole organization of them. But the vast, vast majority of them are Catholic. To pretend otherwise, you know, for evangelicals to pretend like Catholics are going to, or I'm sorry, 
Hispanics are going to be joining them. Well, to the extent you agree with Catholics, sure. <laughs> but otherwise, no. <laughs> this is more of that um, Republican fallacy of, of the Hispanics are our natural allies. You know, they're the natural allies of conservatives and, you know, never mind... Never mind the track record that, you know, these people coming in from socialist countries have, lo and behold, tended to vote socialist. Yeah, never mind the track record. Ignore your lying eyes. We tell you this is true. I think one of the things that you've really tried to bring to an understanding of evangelicalism, particularly on the issue of immigration, is that a lot of the immigration uh, that we see in our country has to do with Hispanic and therefore is, is highly Christian, evangelical, or Catholic. Do you see that sort of blind spot uh, among evangelicals as they talk about uh, various political issues, but specifically immigration? That blind spot continues to diminish, to diminish as time progresses. Uh, I would argue about 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago, that that blind spot was more than a blind spot. It was just complete myopia as it pertains to looking beyond the self. Uh, but in the past 10 years, great progress has been made. And that Again, I want to ask if, if all these Hispanics coming in from the South American countries are so Christian and so family values and all this good stuff, why have they why have they torn or dumped California into the toilet? Now, not entirely them. I'm not placing the entire blame. But why haven't these supposedly natural conservatives come in and changed California for in a more conservative direction? Why hasn't that happened? You see, here's the problem. You have a theory here. Uh, who Who's talking right now? Rodriguez or whatever? Your theory, is, or maybe it was more. I lost track. But your theory is Hispanics are going to come in and be natural conservatives. Um, that's all well and good, but your theory has been tested, and it didn't pan out. So once again, am I supposed to believe you or my lion eyes? And now I do believe that a great number of evangelicals understand that even the issue of immigration is not just a political issue. It is primarily a Christian issue because the vast majority of those that demonstrate the growth component of major denominations, the Southern Baptist, the Assemblies of God, Church of God, Christian Missionary Alliance, Foursquare, and others, the growth is stemming or comes out of this Latino demographic. So now there's a shift. No longer is it a political issue primarily, but more of a Christian issue. It may very well be the future of American evangelicalism and American Christianity, how we treat the immigrant in America today. <laughs> I, I, I would like to see those numbers because I'm suspicious of them, to, to say the least. Um, but if that's where you're placing your, your bets on the future, uh, I wouldn't. Best case scenario for, for your evangelicals is they turn out to be Catholics, which certainly closer than, say, Muslims. Uh, you know, uh, they're other Christians. But, yeah, you... The future of evangelicalism is not there. I No. It's just not. Again, who am I going to believe? This guy or my lion eyes? Well, let's talk about the uh, article that you uh, co-authored with uh, Dr. Moore in the Wall Street Journal. It's a very striking title, Immigrant Bashers Will Lose the Evangelical Vote. It was specifically, I think, aimed at a statement that Donald Trump uttered. In these kind of early days of the Republican, uh, particularly as we see the Republican nominees that, that are that are numbering, I think, at this point in the dozens, and, uh, you know, th there's a common theme, which is things are going wrong and we're all going to fix it, and no one has been more you know, outspoken on that than Donald Trump and specifically on the immigrant issues. And then you've got, you know, conservative voices like Ann Coulter who just kind of thoroughly get behind it. You guys were pretty hard on this. Why did you choose to speak out this early in the process and specifically about the comment that Donald Trump made? John, in 1845, a political party emerged in the American political spectrum, a splinter group of the Whig Party. It was known as the Native American Party more commonly known as the Know Nothings. The party lasted from 1845 to 1860. I, I prefer the second sort of nomenclature described, which is the Know Nothing, because that is what's currently happening right now in our political landscape, primarily coming out of right now out of the Republican wing. Let me explain. 
the oh so typical Trump voters uh, and Trump, he's just an idiot. The Trump voters are just an idiot. They're just idiots. They're just idiots, you know. You know, st stick with us because we've had such a great track record. It, you know, that's been, that's been a discussed at length on other channels. I, I, I don't even want to, I don't even want to dignify it with an answer. Donald Trump is the uh, regurgitation of the know nothing political platform in 21st century context. It is nativism on steroids. It is this idea that conservatism stands defined by the color of our skin, by a, a Western European Anglo Saxon rubric or model. And, and no, no, damn it, no. First of all, it's the idea that nations have borders, or at least they're supposed to. Second of all, Trump's not saying deport the, the Hispanics. He's saying deport the illegals. And Trump's doing a lot better among Hispanics than anyone, anyone would have anticipated. It's almost like the people that are already here have no interest in bringing in more. I don't know. That's just a guess on my part. And that's not conservatism. The Republican Party is suffering. There's a battle for the soul of the Republican Party and the conservative movement. The op-ed piece spoke... I will say that. There is a battle for the soul. But that's not conservatism. What exactly is conservatism here? Is conservatism open borders? I mean, shit, I'm a libertarian and I don't even believe in open borders. the Latino community, a community that resonates, by the way, with many of the values of Ronald Reagan, of course, the values of Abraham Lincoln, the values of... Then why don't they vote that way ever? No matter how much the Republican Party bends over backwards to kiss their ass, they don't ever seem to vote for the Republicans in large numbers. Why do you suppose that is? It's almost like this, their natural conservative stuff is kind of bullshit. Almost like I mean maybe I'm wrong. You can you feel free to enlighten me, uh, Russell or Samuel or whichever one we're on now. Of a Jack Kemp, is this the conservative movement of Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, and Jack Kemp, or is it the Republican Party of Tom Tancredo, Pat Buchanan, and Donald Trump? And they definitely will. Would... Yeah, Pat Buchanan. You mean the guy who's been right a lot more than you guys? I'm not even a huge fan of Pat Buchanan, but. He's called it on a lot more things than I, I bet you have, buddy. He's also a lot more conservative than you are. ...will not only lose the Latino vote, that's obvious, but they may very well jeopardize the evangelical vote that no longer suffers, and praise God for the prophetic leadership of Dr. Russell Moore, that we, that we no longer suffer, not perfectly, but we no longer suffer collectively from this ideological myopia where we were an extension of the Republican Party regardless of the candidate or the circumstance. Again, the polls aren't showing he's going to lose an evangelical vote. And uh, once again, he's doing better than anyone would have thought amongst Hispanics. Uh, I will say that, that there is, to the extent that it's true, and it's really not, uh, it, is, it is nice that evangelicals have decided to stop being the Republican Party's bitch. I have often commented in the past how it's amazing how the Republicans, the Republican Party can always count on the evangelical vote as long as they manage to be slightly better than the Democrats, which is a remarkably low bar. So it, it is a, a wake-up call indeed that Donald Trump may very well spell the death knell of the Republican Party for, for generations to come. Um, that is the most foolish thing I've ever heard. Donald Trump... Will, will breathe new life into the Republican Party and is already doing so. Is already doing so. I, I've never seen this kind of energy. I saw a little bit of it with Ron Paul back in the 08 election cycle. But even that was, was clearly fringe. Donald Trump is appealing to wide swaths of people. Unless there is significant pushback. Dr. Moore, I just want to... That's a, that's a powerful statement right there. Can you just react to that? 
Well, I do not think the Donald Trump phenomenon will last. I, I really don't. But I Yeah, and neither is gonna Gamergate, huh? <laughs> I love that. It's not gonna last. It's not gonna last. You know, maybe it won't. Maybe it won't. Um but I I am I'm I, I said Gamergate because I am just very impressed with the parallels I'm seeing in that, you know, all the powerful people scoff at it. Oh, it's going to peter out. It's going to peter out. You know, they said Trump. Oh, he's not seriously running. Oh, he's not going to file that uh, that financial paperwork. Oh, he's not going to do anything in the polls. Oh, he's going to bomb at the, uh, at the debate. Oh, this feud with Megyn Kelly, it's going to destroy him. Oh, that's going to destroy him. This is going to destroy him. Oh, oh. And he doesn't. It doesn't happen, does it? So you keep predicting, Russell, that uh, he'll he'll peter out. Maybe he will, but <laughs> the track record's not looking so good for you guys right now, is it? I think it is an important moment uh, to speak to the sort of things that are going on there. I mean, when, when Donald Trump said, and this is what uh, Sam and I were responding to in our op-ed, when he said that uh, Mexico is sending uh, rapists and, and murderers into the country, and he's, he's appealing to fear with this demagogic uh, painting of Mexican immigrants as rapists. Uh, then when asked about it, what's your evidence that this is happening? And he's able to say, oh, uh, just, just conversations that I've had with, with Border Patrol. We're at it. What's your evidence that, again, are, do you people not open your eyes? Why do you think Mexicans, Mexican immigrants uh, commit violent crimes at a much disproportionately higher rate? Okay? At a much disproportionately higher rate than Mexican citizens in Mexico in general. You know, there are cases where the Mexican government has put up signs and, 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 and shit and handed out pamphlets or whatever telling the poor people there, here's how you go to America and get food stamps and shit. This is all documented. You know, actual conservatives, and I'm not even a huge fan of them, but like Michael Savage... Have been have been harping on this for years. Have been pointing this out for years. You don't want to see it because you just have this fantasy that no, they're going to come here and be your buddies. It's just not panning out, though, is it? We're at a moment where we have to understand we may have differences of opinion about what is the best way to fix an immigration system that almost everybody agrees is broken. Uh, we may have differences of opinion as to how to fix that. I mean, even Sam and I have a few differences on should the president have used an executive order or, or, or not. I mean, those, we can... Are you kidding me? Wait, wait, wait. Are you trying to tell me that 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 uh, Samuel Rodriguez here thinks the president should have used that executive order? Ugh. I thought I thought Samuel Rodriguez smelled a little of sulfur. From the pit of hell and smells like smoke. We can have even bigger differences than that among ourselves. What we don't have the option to have differences uh, about as Christians is on immigrants themselves. And the sort of demonization of immigrants and immigrant families is something that is completely contrary to our understanding of uh, persons as created in the image of God. And that's especially true when, uh, when you have a beating up on the most vulnerable, some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Oh, don't give me that crap. You know what? Pointing out that rapists and murderers and thieves are rapists and murderers and thieves is not denying them the dignity that they were created in the image of God. I assume you would agree that ISIS are a bunch of savages. It doesn't mean you don't think they're human beings. And yeah, they're committing the violent crimes at much disproportionately high levels. Okay? What about the fucking dignity of Catherine Steinel? Where was her dignity? Where was your concern for her? Where was your concern for the, the countless like her? For the purpose of political gain. And that's what's happening here. I mean, the, the, the sort of language that Donald Trump is, is using, he's not providing proposed solutions to the problem yes he is build a wall there's a solution deport them there's a solution I, uh, holy crap what he's doing is to say i mean most recently let's get rid of birthright citizenship well you, you can't get rid of birthright citizenship 
relationship by an executive order. Uh, that, that's something that is going to take a constitutional amendment to repeal part of the 14th Amendment. And then, and then Donald Trump turns around and says he doesn't even think the 14th Amendment is constitutional. Uh, you liar. You absolute liar. Let it let it go on record that Dr. Russell Moore, I believe is the one speaking, yeah, uh, is is a goddamn liar. Or, or maybe he's a useful idiot, but I, I don't think he can be that stupid. I assume he dressed himself today. That's not what Trump said. The 14th Amendment says that um, any person born, um, shit, I forget the exact language, but it's under the jurisdiction of the United States. Will, will be granted citizenship. Now, you can debate whether that means, uh, whether that in- includes anchor babies. Because after all, the person that was here legally, was were they, were they under the jurisdiction? I, you could read that either way. You really could. Um, according to the guy that wrote the amendment, last, as far as I know, he actually was on record saying... And I, I forget the guy's name, but I, I remember hearing this on, I think Savage. I mean, I could be wrong, but I had heard this on Savage. The guy who wrote the amendment was on record saying it doesn't apply to anchor babies. But let's put that aside. Trump isn't saying the 14th Amendment is unconstitutional. That's asinine, and you know it's asinine. You are deliberately lying to make him look stupid. He is saying that the current interpretation of the 14th Amendment is wrong. Now, you can say that he's wrong or he's right. You can agree or disagree with him. Okay. From what I understand, the uh, guy who wrote it would disagree with you, uh, Russell. But he's not saying the 14th Amendment is unconstitutional. And he is arguing that the current interpretation is wrong. That you can either disagree with them or not, um, but what you just did there, Doctor Russell Moore, is you lied about it. You, I would say, probably very deliberately misrepresented what the man said. You are a liar. A, uh, which is is self contradictory and, and incoherent. It it's sure is, but he didn't say that. Proposal. It's not meant to be a serious proposal. What it is meant to do is to use this population as a group of people to express rage and anger uh, from the American people for all sorts of reasons. Uh, Loss of manufacturing jobs all the way over uh, to the the broken political process in Washington. That's just wrong. Well, uh, well, Doctor... Lying about what a man said is also wrong, Russell. And yes, it is a serious proposal. Now, I don't know exactly how Trump thinks he's going to do that. Um, because the courts have final say on the uh, in, on the uh, interpretation. Maybe he's planning on getting uh, Supreme Court justices in that agree with him. Whatever. Uh, the mere fact that he's even pointing this out, though, does do a great deal to shift the debate and the overall public opinion. <sighs> Dr. Moore, I, it, it seems to me that Just this is really you know, one example of... Uh kind of a larger issue that evangelicals and people of faith have to really address if we don't like what's happening in our culture. And I think a lot of us don't. The temptation is to kind of make, I think, outrage a political strategy. And, and uh, you know, that that's one of the things on Donald Trump that's been so strange is the things that he's actually proposing. I tweeted out, you know, this past week that it seems to me, you know, he, he kind of sounds sometimes like the uh, candidate for the third grade class president who promises everyone ice cream every day, even though, you know, that's a possible for the third grader to deliver. Is this a question of theological versus political loyalties that many evangelicals face today? Yes, I think it is. Uh, it, and it's not only in terms of, of issues, but in terms of uh, demeanor. I mean, George... Oh, good Lord, here we go. Here we go with the frightened little church ladies about to clutch their pearls. Oh my, what a brute, I never... Go go ahead, Dr. Liar Moore. Will, uh, rightly, has criticized the Donald Trump movement as a kind of primal screen therapy uh, with the, the old idea from the 1960s that you could get rid of your your childhood problems by simply screaming as loud as you can in rage. And that's what's taking place, which is why the defenders of Donald Trump often will say things along the lines. 
lines of, well, he's just tapping into a lot of anger into this country. Well, I can tap into anger by slamming my hand against the wall, but that doesn't mean that we're moving toward a, a constructive solution to whatever it is that's making me angry. And then when you put uh, around this figure uh, people such as Ann Coulter, uh, who is saying things like uh, what she said in her Twitter post, uh, that she doesn't care if Donald Trump performs abortions in the Oval Office as long as he uh, carries out his immigration plan. Or right right in the middle of the, the Planned Parenthood. Oh, she, do you not understand what hyperbole is? She's saying that she believes immigration is the most important issue right now. Um, jeez. Oh, Lord. I don't even think I'm going to get through this. This is fucking exhausting. The demeanor. The demeanor is so upsetting. Oh, and George Will. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. And, and George Will the other day, what was he saying? Like, um, you know, oh, uh, oh, God damn, what the hell? Trump. He was saying something about Trump. Like, small government people better not support Trump. He's not small government. Like, like George Will and the rest of the Republicans have been fucking small government. Ever. This is just like what I said about Glenn Beck. Little betas are triggered by a little bit of alpha swagger. And there's no bigger betas than, than churchianity cucks. This, I'm, I'm genuinely pissed off hearing this. And I'm not pissed off because, oh, they attack Trump. No, no, no. I, I, Trump's a big boy. And I... No, I'm pissed off because this is this is the sad excuse for men that pass for leadership in this country. You want to talk about a bad demeanor? Somebody who should apologize for quote unquote demeanor? Jeb Bush gave a speech today attacking Trump in Spanish. That that needs to forever be remembered as as long as Jeb Bush ever dares to, you know, show his face in public. Um that's I guess Jeb Bush's new slogan is Make Mexico Great Again. Oh, jeez. I, I, I'm damn near at a loss. Something I noticed back in the 2012 election cycle was I noticed a lot more evangelicals were supporting Ron Paul than evangelical leaders were. Evangelical leaders hated him. Um, rank and file seemed to really like him. He seemed to do pretty well amongst them. I think he won the Values Voter Summit, if memory serves. Uh, but then there was another straw poll, and these were unofficial straw polls, but another straw poll of evangelical leaders where Rick Santorum went hands down. And that was when I began to really realize, or notice, I should say, a, uh, a disconnect between evangelicals and evangelical leadership. The, the rank and files of, of the Western conservative church and, and the, uh, the leadership. Uh, the, the 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 either plastic alphas or outright outright effeminate weasels that represent us. This is another case of that. Trump is doing quite well amongst evangelicals. Um, little old church ladies like Glenn Beck and and John uh, Stone Street here they clutch their pearls and oh my oh and somebody get it the smelling salts for him. So I get him onto the fainting couch. But the the rank and file like him. And um the, these two these two clowns he's had on here, they can they can pry and this is deliberate. This is deliberately trying to paint him as something he's not. This is deliberately trying They want to isolate you. See, you're, you, if you're listening to me, you probably like Trump. Even if he's not your top guy, you like him. You know, you, you look at him and you're like, yeah, yeah, I, I, like, I like the cut of his jib. And you know what? They want you to think that you are, that, that you're the bad guy, that you're the, you're the quack, you're the outliner for thinking this. And this is exactly what I noticed. I'm going to come back to Gamergate. This is exactly what I noticed in geek culture before Gamergate even hit. Um, all the people who didn't buy the SJW nonsense, they were treated like quacks and, and we'll shun them and they, oh, no, no, they're, they're nobody. When it was most of us, 
Even if we didn't agree with each other, most of us weren't SJWs. And and most, or, or at least a good portion of evangel or evangelicals, they, they see the appeal in Trump, even if he's not their number one guy. They like Trump. Uh, they like what Trump is doing. And most of them, indeed most of the country, is actually to the right of even Trump on the immigration issue. Uh, barely, but yes. You know, most people, you say, you know, illegal aliens, well, if they're illegal, get them, get them out of here. You know, and then the, the establishment, like these, these fine gentlemen here, oh, it's more complicated than that, and think of the children. But most of us are like, they're illegals, get them out. And they want you to think, for that common sense, natural reaction, they want you to think, oh, you're the outlier. You're the outlier. You're the weird one. You're the... You're the extremist. Never forget, this This is a deliberate psyops, basically, against you. Um, I don't think it's working. I think it's pathetic. And I think, I think people realize it. Um, but it's very deliberate. I'm not going to finish this. I, I'm... I'm to the little counter here, I'm 1329 out of 2525 on, on the minutes here. And, and I'm not I'm not gonna finish the whole thing. It's I, I caught the one part I really wanted to when the guy outright lied about the uh, 14th Amendment. And frankly, it's it's just you get the gist. I mean, I'll, I'll put a link in the description. You go you go check this nonsense out if you want, and yeah, you know, feel free to leave a comment or two. Um Politely, of course, politely. But yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't go any further in this nonsense. It's not worth the time. The, the point I wanted to show you all was made. All right. Um, thank you all for listening. And just remember, you can't stump the Trump.